So you're sitting at your desk one day, and a client calls. This is an old client that you've known for some time. You used to work with him in the past. He's now moved on to another company, and he needs your services. He's a project that is a perfect fit for you. He wants a membership site with an e-commerce component. Here's the catch. He needs it in six weeks. He's got a trade show coming up, and they want to debut their new site at this trade show. So the, the timeline's aggressive. But the budget is ginormous. Imagine the largest project you've ever worked on, and now multiply it by three. This is the kind of budget that's going to make your whole year. So you say, yes, I'll do it. It's an aggressive timeline. So you jump right in. You skip the scoping phase. You skip the wireframes. You go right to code. I mean, again, the timeline's aggressive. So week one. Project's going pretty smoothly. You jump in as an extra coder because that's the skill set that you have. Your team needs the extra resources. You pull some late nighters, but it's not out of control. You build the foundation of the platform, and at the end of the week, you present it to the client. And you show him the back end system. And he is underwhelmed. He wants to see the UI, he wants to see the creative. He wants to see the front end. But you explain that this is the foundation of the system. These are the hard parts. I need to build these first. And he trusts you because you've worked together in the past. In the meantime, you've missed another deadline with a different client. But that's OK. The budget is ginormous. So that other client can fall by the wayside. Week two. Your team continues to work on the back-end code. The late-nighters have turned into all-nighters. You work the weekend and you miss your daughter's soccer game. A new stakeholder calls and says, there's a blog component to the site that they have uh, on another platform, and it needs to be ported over. So it needs to be part of this site. So you say, OK. Again, the budget is ginormous. There's enough padding where you can cover this. There's no time for a change order. So you say yes. At the end of the week, you present again and show the client that the entire back-end system is built. Look at what we've done in just two weeks' time. And the client says, where's the UI? Now he's getting a little anxious. But you assure him the majority of the system is built, and now we're going to focus on the creative. Week three, the stakeholder sends over the credentials for the blog content that needs to be ported. And you log in, and it's done in Drupal. In addition to that, there's a ton of metadata for each of these blog posts that you hadn't anticipated because it was described to you as simple blog content that was going to be ported in. But that's OK because the budget is ginormous. It's well padded, and you can pull a few all nighters and take care of it. Now the whole team is pulling all nighters. You've missed another soccer game and you've missed a date with your spouse. You have now neglected the other client to the point where they send a nasty gram. That's what I call a mean email. At the end of the week, you present the full back end and a partial UI, and the client gets pissed because the site isn't progressing like he had envisioned. You let him know, we've got three more weeks. We've got plenty of time. We're going to do this. I've got the whole team pulling on lighters. We're going to make it happen. Week four. You don't leave the office for an entire week. 
your team is making several mistakes due to fatigue. The Drupal project is so large that you've had to dedicate half of your team to it. The client calls and informs you that they've decided to go in another direction. You're not making the progress that they envisioned, and because this is so close, they're just going to set up a Squarespace site and roll with that. Ooh, I touched a nerve. If the client that you neglected has called to inform you that they've hired another developer, and a third client that you've neglected um, has now told you that they're getting a little nervous. Your kids hate you. Your spouse leaves you. I'm sorry, that went a little dark at the end. <laughs> you don't shower. So here's my question. What did the client do wrong? Nothing. The client did nothing wrong. What did you do wrong? Let's get specific. <laughs> I didn't shower. That's, the first, that's probably the first thing. What did you do wrong? Didn't scope the project, okay? So by skipping the scoping phase, I skipped a key part of the communication with the client, right? We didn't lay out the expectations as to what's going to be delivered when. Good. What else did I do wrong? What's that? I was, I was over-promising and under-delivering. You didn't ask what, what content and platform she was currently working on. Good. I didn't do discovery, right? So the, the comment was I didn't ask what other platforms and technologies that the client was working with. So I had no idea what was coming my way. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take that a step further. I didn't assess what the customer valued, right? So I didn't ask the right questions. There was no benchmark. There was no measurement for how I was going to succeed on this project. So I was shooting at a goal that the client wasn't even concerned about. So the, the comment was about my exit strategy, and that's good. I'm going to say it a little bit differently. Are there any poker players in the room? Raise your hand. Fellow, I should say fellow poker players in the room. The key to winning at poker, if you don't play poker, is one of the, one of the major keys to winning at poker is called proper starting hand requirements. So choosing the right hands to start with, right? And I think this is important. It applies here because... Frankly, I shouldn't have taken that project to begin with. Not every project is right for every developer. Some projects, and I see these a lot, are too small. But some projects are too big. So I think what you said is, you got in over your head, right? The team might not, be, uh, might not have been big enough. I might not have had the right resources. The timeline was too aggressive. The project was too big. And that happens. What else? I neglected my other customers. Yep. I did that's thank you. So the comment was I didn't communicate enough to the client. And part of that communication would have been communicating about scope changes had I had a scope. Right? But once I have a scope, when that Drupal site comes in or that new stakeholder calls or anything changes within the scope, it's my job to communicate that that's a change. And we'll talk about that. Anything else? I missed a soccer game. I, I didn't set correct boundaries, right? And my boundaries have to do with my personal time. And that's going to be different for each of you. But your boundaries, your personal boundaries are important, right? Because ultimately that's what keeps you happy. That's what keeps you motivated. That's what keeps you wanting to do a good job for your client. My kids are the most important thing in my life. I don't miss soccer games. Now, this story was an amalgam of several stories that I've amassed over the past 20 years in business. 
All of these things have happened to me, with the exception of my kids hating me, most days. Right? But I used to miss soccer games, and I used to miss kid events, because I didn't set healthy boundaries. So thank you. That's great feedback. So let's talk about a bunch of words that end in Y. And these are some of the words that I like to keep in mind when I'm managing my team and I'm setting expectations with clients. And the first one, and I think this is important, is honesty. It is important that you are honest with your clients at all times. And honesty is tough. It's tough to fess up when something goes wrong with a project, when something goes wrong with a site, when a site goes down, when you've made a mistake. Those are tough things to admit. But you know what's even tougher? Getting caught in a lie. So I've trained my entire team, and I've always used this practice, that when something goes wrong, it's our job to call the client first and let them know what went wrong and let them know what we did about it and let them know what we did so that doesn't hap it doesn't happen again and now we're moving on with our day. That's honesty. What's that? I didn't call them first in my big amalgam story. Uh, depending on the situation. So the comment was, I didn't call them first. Again, it depends on the situation, right? If the client calls me and says something's wrong and it was our mistake, I say, that was our mistake, right? If we find something that went wrong, I call the client say, and say, this went wrong. That's honesty. The next one is transparency, and these are similar, but I looked at a, a definition before I got up here on the difference between honesty and transparency, and I liked it, so I'm going to read it. Honesty is when you reveal the truth that you feel needs to be known. Transparency is when others can see for themselves the truth, the truth they feel they need to know. So when I talk about transparency on my team, we have full transparency with the way we work on a project. We work completely out in the open. Our client has a, an entire view for our development process. They're able to see exactly where we're at. They're able to look at our internal conversation. I let the clients know that it might not be pretty sometimes. We may use a couple of four-letter words, but that's transparency. Honesty is when you reveal the truth that you feel needs to be known. So it's coming from you. Transparency is when others can see for themselves the, truth, the truths they feel they need to know. So it's, it's you, it's, honesty is sort of working outward, and transparency is your client looking inward. And that's what I like as the differentiator. Integrity. Your clients are hiring you as a trusted advisor. They're hiring you for your expertise. They are putting their trust in you. So it's your job to act in their best interest at all times. And if you don't do that, they will move on. Accountability. My team is trained to take full responsibility for any part of the project. And that includes things that we didn't do. There may be something that goes wrong with a project that we had no control over. At our shop, the buck stops here. We'll take care of it. We will take ownership. That's accountability. Along with that is consistency. So the way to retain clients is to be consistent. 
If you act one way in a certain situation and another way in another, situa in another situation, that's confusing. It's jarring. If you always act the same way, good or bad, and I'm not judging, at least the client knows what they're counting on, and they can decide for them whether you're the right fit. But be consistent. Part of accountability and consistency is your response time. We talked about setting healthy boundaries a little bit, and we'll cover that some more uh, as we go. But consistency is we will get back to you within two business hours, and then following through with that. And if for some reason you can't get back to them within two business hours, somebody either follows up or you get back and you explain why. Right now I have an autoresponder set on my email that says, I'm at WordCamp and I'm traveling this week. If you need help, contact Sarah Weefold, my production manager. I can't get back to my clients right now. I'm speaking in front of you. Two hours, two business hours might not be right for you. Figure out what works for you, or more importantly, figure out what you can commit to and follow through with and be consistent on, and that should be your policy. And last, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I got one more. Vulnerability. Um, somebody else touched on this today, actually, I heard a couple of people touch on this today, but one of the things I like to tell my clients is, I'm not perfect. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. Your project isn't going to be as smooth as you expect. That's just the nature of how we develop, right? It, it, it's weird to say this, but this is not an exact science, right? There's some creativity involved here. There's going to be opinions. There's some sub subjectivity. So because of that, we are flexible. You know, we're not going to get it right on the first try, and that's okay. If you set that expectation on the, out on the outset, you're going to be better off when a mistake happens. And it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to say that to a client. I say it to my clients all the time, especially when I make a mistake. Look, we screwed up. We made it right. What's important about that statement is everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's human. It's how you respond to those mistakes that sets you apart from your competitors. And lastly, and I realize it's not a Y word, but I want to talk about respect. And I've heard this as a running theme through several talks today, and I hear this quite a bit in the industry. How many times have you heard somebody say, that client's an asshole? This client's being unreasonable. Oh, I got another email. When those statements are made, there's a lack of respect for the client. And that's a problem. And what I encourage you to do, if, if, if you do this, or if somebody on your team does this, or you're working alongside of somebody who has this attitude, it's important that you change your frame of reference. You may not like the person that you're working for, but they're paying you money. And as such, they deserve your respect. So even though you may not like them, you need to get in the right mindset where you have a respect for what they're trying to accomplish because they're paying you to help them accomplish it. And if you can't, you need to find somebody else that can work with that client. I see a, a lot of disrespect between vendors, between developers and clients. It's rampant. I've watched it for 20 years now. And it, it is a shame. But if you're thinking about what I'm saying right now, and you're th you have a specific client in your head, and you're thinking, well, Steve, but I, I get what you're saying, but this client, I mean, he's really an asshole. 
I encourage you to take a step back. Think about that. Think about if that's a client that you can get yourself in the mindset where you actually do start respecting them. It's going to change your relationship. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? By the way, Adam and Mindy both touched on this, and I, 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 you know, I, they, they both made great points on this. So let's talk about some tips for success when it comes to managing expectations. And I've talked about several of these at, at password camps in different talks, and some of these are new. Um, so this isn't a complete list, but these are the ones I wanted to go over today. Don't assume. That's number one, um, and that's number one for any situation, personal or business. That really is just a, a good relationship tip. Going back to my, my first story about what went wrong with the client, the developer in that situation made a lot of assumptions. The opposite of not assuming is asking questions. And when, you're, when I'm working with a client, and when um, my production manager, Sarah, is working with a client, we're constantly asking questions. Because we don't want to leave anything up to assumptions. Because when we assume something, or we don't have a full understanding, and we move forward with development, we lose money. It's not the client's fault. We didn't have a full understanding, and we went forward anyway. That's on me. And if the client comes back and says, you missed the mark, Again, that's my fault. I didn't ask the right questions. So ask the right questions so that you're not making any assumptions. And you know what? Ask more questions on top of that. I tell my clients at the beginning, especially with a new relationship, I let them know, hey, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. I hope you're okay with that. And I do that because I want to make sure that we have 100% understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. And when we have a, a, a call and go over something, and then I need a new person to come in and, and, and ask different questions, I let the client know at the onset of that call, hey, I realize some of what you're going to cover may, be, may sound like review. And I know you've gone over this before. But we, we, we'd like to hear it again. Going back to my original story, um, this is a thing that I used to run into for years. I would focus on the wrong part of the project first. The wrong part of the project first. What's the wrong part of the project? The one that is lowest on the list for the client of their priorities. So the way not to do that is to simply ask the client, What's the most important part of this project to you? Now, the first response you're going to get back is, all of it. And the way to ask it differently is say, OK, let's break it down. What do you want to see first? Where do you want us to focus? What is the most important thing that you see during our development timeline? And you may learn that it's completely opposite of what you thought you were going to be focusing on. And that's a tough thing for a, a pure developer to grasp. Because developers love code, right? I love code. I'm a coder at heart. I come into this world with a, a PHP MySQL background. So those are the kinds of things that excite me. But those aren't the kinds of things that excite my clients. When I go to a presentation meeting and I've got a whole bunch of back-end code and server-side functionality to show my clients, they don't care. They just assume that stuff works. That's all background stuff for a reason. That's just the way it's supposed to be. Typically, what the client cares about is what they see on the front end, the creative, the UI, the HTML, the Photoshop files. But ask those questions. 
ask them up front so that you can set your deliverables accordingly. Because if you do that, that's what's going to keep your client happy throughout the entire development process. Make sense? Similar, don't react. Good or bad, don't react. Um, Mindy said this during the emotional mind, and I liked this a lot, right? It's very easy to get an email from clients and then shoot back a response. I do it all the time. I'm an emotional guy. What I recommend that you do, and Mindy kind of said this where she sort of steps back, takes a breath, thinks, right, gets into her, um, what did she call it, the, um, uh, what's that? Wise mind. Wise mind, right? I love that. Here's what I do. I see the email, I pull out a pad of paper, and I write with a pen everything I want to say. I get it all out of my system. I write out the response I want to say, and then I throw it in the shredder. And then I take a walk. I get myself out from behind my desk, I breathe, I think. If I need more input, I go talk to Sarah. I show her the email and I say, what do you, what do you think about this? And then I go write a draft of what I want to say. And then I take another walk. And then I write the draft and I send the email. If it's more important than that, I'll take that walk and I'll make a phone call. The most important thing is, is to not react immediately because I guarantee, good or bad, it's going to come out wrong. You're going to say something that you regret. And once you send that email, you can't take it back. Once you send that text, it's out there. So I encourage you just to take a breath. Take a walk. Just do whatever it takes to calm yourself down so that you don't react. Because it's going to end badly, and I'm speaking from experience. <clears throat> you can't control anybody else's reaction. Forget about just your client. You have no control over how somebody is going to react. And this one took me years to realize. Anybody here under 25? This is the older you talking to you from your future. <laughs> because I started my company when I was 25. And so some of the younger people on my staff still struggle with this, and we talk about this, and I train on this. But the conversation typically goes like this. <clears throat> I have to inform this client that, uh, about this change order, and they're going to be pissed. And my reaction is, or my, my, my comment to that is, how do you know? So what's important is that you don't act in a way it's an assumption on what their reaction is going to be. I know that's kind of third level thinking. The best you can do, if you put all my why words together, is convey the information as simply and straightforwardly as possible. And however the client reacts is how they're going to react. They may get pissed, and then you can deal with that. They may write you back and say, great, and then you can deal with that. You have no control over how they're going to react. And what's important to think about is, you don't know who peed in their cornflakes that morning. Right? The barista at Starbucks may have messed up their order. Right? They may have gotten into a fender bender. So you send off an email, they just got into the office after the barista messed up their latte, and they send back a scathing email. Oh, well. It happened. You have no control over that. So stop trying. Right. 
Part of maintaining healthy boundaries is first defining what your boundaries are. If you haven't done that, you need to take a step back and figure out what your boundaries are. What are you willing to do and not do? When are you willing to work and not work? When are you willing to answer your phone, to answer email? Are you available after hours? Are you available on the weekends? If you set these boundaries and you define these for you, forget, take the client out of the equation for a minute, define these boundaries for yourself and then abide by these boundaries, very quickly the client will start following these boundaries. You don't even have to communicate it. But if you define a boundary and say, you know what, I'm not working on the weekends, and the very next weekend the client emails you and you answer that email, you don't respect your own boundaries. So the, the big part of maintaining healthy boundaries is that you have to respect your own boundaries first. So if you don't know what your boundaries are, I encourage you to take a step back and define them. And I've only really talked about what hours you work or if you're willing to work after hours or weekends, right? Boundaries have to do with, am I willing to miss my kid's soccer game? Am I willing to neglect my spouse, neglect my significant other? You know, am I willing to work late to do these things? That's up to you. I can't define that for you. But once you set them, respect them. That's how you maintain them. Because as soon as you break them, they're no good. <clears throat> That's my dad. My dad said this to me recently. He was in the hospital. And we were sitting, and I was having a tough time with a client. And I was sitting in this hospital room, and I was sending an email. And he was bored. And he had me read it to him. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, we're going to reword that whole thing. My dad said, my dad's an old school businessman, and that's where I got a lot of my business skills from. But my dad said, two rules, never complain, never apologize. And I love this. Try following this next time you send a client email. Reread an email that you've sent recently and see if you complained. Complaining can be subtle. Complaining might be, yeah, I spent all last week working really hard on this project. Do you know how much your client cares? You say. <laughs> Complaining might even be, miss my kid's soccer game to do this for you. You know how much your client cares? Zero. So don't do it. Take it out. And the reason you take it out is because your emails to your clients should just be factual. This happened. Here's what I did about it. You requested this. Here's my response. The part I like about don't apologize is because you can say things differently when you're not apologizing, right? Apologizing says, I did something wrong. And that's not usually the case. Again, we heard this from Mindy, but a client calls or emails and says, you know, I blame you for this. Doesn't mean you necessarily did that wrong. You don't have to apologize. You can take responsibility without ap apologizing. But I, I love how simple this is, and I've used this since my dad said it, and it's actually changed my tone. And this is just recently for me. So I think about this every time I send an email. Am I com complaining? Am I apologizing? And then I go and I reword. Or if I'm on a call, I think to myself, okay, don't complain. Don't apologize. Take responsibility, but don't do these two things. A couple more. Sorry, I lost my place in the document. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been up here for a half an hour. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
part of uh, not complaining um, also goes hand in hand with blaming, right? When I read a lot of emails or I, e or I edit emails or I edit client communication, the way I take blame statements out of something is I remove words like you and I, right? Even if you're not blaming, as soon as you say you or your or I, you're making it personal. It doesn't need to be. Take, try taking those pronouns out of your emails and out of your communication, and they're going to start sounding a lot more factual. <clears throat> also, try removing the word always. And I call this throwing in the kitchen sink. Right? So if you send an email and say, <clears throat> you always, uh, <laughs> that's a little more, more personal, but I like that. That's more, that's something I would say to my son. You always forget to take the garbage out. <laughs> that's more, that's throwing in the kitchen sink, right? That's saying, you've always done this. What my son's going to think if I say, you always, take the gar you, al you always forget to take the garbage out, he's going to say, well, you know what? Three weeks ago, I remembered to take it out. More specifically, the better way to say that is, you didn't take the garbage out this week. That's fact. I didn't throw in the kitchen sink. I addressed the exact problem. And I also didn't hold on to a grudge. Because when I hear a statement with an always in it, I think that I'm dealing with a person who holds grudges. <clears throat> Email is the worst form of communication. It is necessary. It is nece oh, thank you. It is necessary, but it is the worst form of communication. What's the best form of communication? Face to face. Face to face is the best form of communication. That's how I prefer to meet with my clients, especially if it's something important. What's the second best way form of communication? Video chat. <laughs> the reason is that it's better than the phone is because I can see somebody's face. I can see the emotion. The reason I love face-to-face -face and video chat is I get to see the body language. So I, I, I get to feel the real meaning behind what somebody's saying, right? It helps me sell. It helps me relate. It helps me really determine if somebody's frustrated, happy, sad. Um, I, can, I can see how they're feeling about me. It's written all over their face. At least I get some indicators. Phone calls, the third best. Um, then text messaging and then email. However, even though it's the worst form of communication, it's necessary because every phone call you have or every face-to-face -face meeting, and we've heard this throughout several talks today, follow it up in writing. Always. So if you've discussed something on a project or you've discussed a change or you've discussed a deliverable or the client's missed a deliverable or you've missed a deliverable or anything, follow it up in writing. And follow it up like this. Here's what I understood our, uh, in our conversation. These are my understandings. Here's what I heard. And write it all out. And at the end of it, give a call to action. Say, did I understand this correctly? And did I miss anything? That gives the client the opportunity to say, yeah, you completely misunderstood me, and that's okay. If it's something even more important, ask for an approval. You can use email for approval. Say, here's what I heard. I just want to say, I, I just want, want you to understand, this, these are the changes I, I understood. Did I understand it correctly? Yes? Great. Please email me back and let me know that you approved this change now that we've put it in writing. So that's why writing, that's why email is critical. This is something I said at WordCamp San Francisco in 2011, and I
and I got a standing ovation. Your client owns the work product. If you are a services company, not a product company, if you are a services company like me, if you're a work for hire company, a client is paying you to do some sort of work, they own it. There's no ifs, and or buts. They own it. Was it Louise that talked about firing a client? Right? She said it perfectly. When you fire a client, give them everything. It will save you a ton of headache. There's nothing to fight over. They paid you. They own it. You are acting as an arm of their company. They're hiring you for your services. They own it. They own your code. They own the design that you made. They own it all. Don't fight over this. I take this a step further. When I'm working with a new client, I educate them to this fact. I let them know that there's other companies out there that don't believe in this. So when you're working with Zeke, you own everything from day one. And because we work in a transparent environment, you have access to everything we're developing throughout the entire process. If you need to cut bait and run, it's yours. That's okay. And I'm confident in saying that because the way I'm going to earn that client's business is by continuing to do quality work. That's how I get them not to leave. It's not by holding their code hostage or their Photoshop files hostage or anything hostage for that matter. It's not by shutting down their website because they didn't pay your bill. These things happen. Uh, and I, I, I wish these were jokes, but this runs rampant in our industry. I've been talking about this for years, and it's still a problem. Most of my clients have come to me because they're frustrated with another developer. Most of my, my projects are not original. I love those projects. I've made a career out of those kinds of projects. And it's because there are other developers out there that are my competitors that do not believe this. This simple thing. Is there anybody that doesn't agree with me? It's okay. It sounds like you, you have a crossover between a product and a service. Okay, that's a little bit different. When it comes to a service, the way I handle, so the question was, you've created a piece of code for a client. You've handed over the code, now they own it and you can't use it elsewhere. Here's how I get, get around that. In my contract, I state, you own the iteration of the code that I create. And the iteration is the key word, right? Which means any routines and any functions that I've built custom for you, I own my brain. I own my knowledge, right? So I own how I, I, I got there somehow, right? And I'm sitting here in front of you because I have a collective pool set of knowledge that came from working with other clients, right? So this knowledge that I gain working on your project, I'm going to use elsewhere, but you own this iteration. It's yours. It was custom built for you. Doesn't mean I can't reuse it. I'm not going to take yours and give it to somebody else. That's how I handle custom code. So it's the same thing, service versus company. So you said you're analogous to just whatever uh, you just said pay first. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so the question was, do my clients pay first? Absolutely. Uh, nope. Yeah. Nope. So depending on the uh, depending on the project, so the question was how do we how do we set up our milestones? Depending on the project, we'll typically uh, break things into three or four payments depending on the size of the project, maybe monthly if it's a longer project, but we always get a deposit. The way my milestones are set up is I'm never too far ahead of where we're at payment-wise. I structure it out so that we're, we're at least paid through where we are right now, or, or we're pretty close, right? I'm not going to lose any money by turning over the work.
My clients can take the code at any time. There's no, if it's done in parts. Okay. In my situation, yes. They get the, so the question was, you've completed the first part, you've been paid, you've started the second part, you haven't been paid for that, they decide to go elsewhere. In my scenario, yes, they own, they own that. Right? They, they own it up, up to what we've built. However, however, I have a clause in my contract that I require a 30-day written notice to leave. So you can leave, but you, you owe me the money for that. You're lock, you are locked into at least pay me for what I've completed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to save that question for just a minute. Let me get through my last slide, and we will we'll address that. Yes. So the question is, if, is there a creative license that if it is not specified in your contract that, that the creator owns that, that work product? That may be true. In my scenario, it's not. I, 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 I put in my contract, you own it. You own the work product. I let them know right up front, this is yours. I'm not going to hold this hostage. So it may be different for you, and that may be different for designers, right? There's, there, this, this differs when you're talking about the, the graphic design world. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, then that's great. So the, there's, two, there's two scenarios there. So the question is, not only are you providing services, you're, design, you're developing a website, but you're also providing hosting, right? So you are offering two services with two different agreements, right? You did develop the website, that is theirs, right? That's, that's theirs, they paid for it, they own it. They own that work product for the website. You're also providing the hosting. If they don't pay their hosting bill, the hosting shuts down. And at that point, you're, you're, you've zipped up the files, you send them the code, because they own that piece of the product. But, but the hosting is a different service that you're providing. It's a whole separate contract. Even though you may treat it as the same contract, those are separate services. I don't do any hosting. I partner with WP Engine and Pagely. And I, the way I set up my hosting agreements is the client actually sets up the, the hosting arrangement with the host and then adds us as a technical contact. I remove myself completely from the hosting. Let me get through my last slide. I'm sorry, there's two more slides. So this came up in the, uh, in the last talk, and I absolutely agree. And I've gotten some heat for this in the past. The customer is always right. Who agrees with this? Show of hands. Let me ask that differently. Who disagrees with this? That's OK. I, I, I said this as my first slide um, at Pressnomics last year. And I got a lot of heat. And I still have people that ask me about this, right? And I went to my dad after that happened, after Pressnomics, because my dad is the smartest man in the world. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I put this slide up on the, on the screen, and half the audience disagreed with me. And he said, what has happened to the world? <laughs> the customer is always right. They're paying your bill. Now, you may not agree with them, right? And that's okay. It doesn't mean they're not right for their business goals. 
That's what they're right about. They have certain goals. They know their business. They know what they want to accomplish. They're right about that. They may not be right about technology. They may not be right about design. That's what they hired you to do. And it's okay to have the conversation about what you disagree about, but ultimately, the customer's paying the bill. They're right. And it's your job to make them right. Who still disagrees? All right, I got less. <laughs> <clears throat> so here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to talk about your question in a minute. But is there anybody that's in currently in a really, really bad, heated client situation that, they don't, that you don't mind talking about in public? Go ahead. Can you, can you stand up? <laughs> What's your name? Emily. Emily. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. What Where are you right now? What is what's your receivable with this client? How long? Okay, so 120 days. Okay, great, thank you. So just to sum up, um, you've got a, a client that's not paying their bills on time. They eventually do pay, but they'll rack up a big bill. Um, and you put them off and, and take care of other work that you know is going to pay faster. Is that a good summary? Okay. Okay. Here's what I would do. Um, firing a client to me is a, um, that's a last resort. That is an absolute last resort. So one thing that um, you know, I took away from the firing a client talk, I mean, everything that she said was great. Um, the only thing that's different for me is, is that's, that's happened to me over 20 years, maybe twice. That's an absolute last resort, right? Before I fire a client, if I'm in a situation like yours, um, I'm going to ask that client to lunch. Let's take a face-to-face -face meeting, right? And the email, the email should be, um, I'd like to level set some expectations. Would you mind if I take you to lunch? OK, so if, if lunch isn't possible, schedule a Skype or schedule a Google Hangout, right? But get them on video chat if you can't do a face-to-face. -face. Yep. Thank you, David. The reason I like that face-to-face -face away from the office is because you're removing any distractions. I hate meeting with people in their office. There's nothing worse than sitting across somebody's desk because they're distracted by their computer screen, their secretary might come in, their phone may ring. You don't know. I like taking people to lunch. I'll pay for it because it gets me their undivided attention for that 45 minutes, okay?
That's not possible in your situation, but that would be my preference. But Gotcha. But the conversation is, or the subject of the conversation is, I need to level set some expectations. You might even say, we've got some expectations that are misaligned. That's exactly what's happening, right? You expect them to pay on time. They expect to be able to take as long as they want. That's a misalignment of expectations. That's all that's going on. There's no blame. Nobody's doing anything wrong, right? You're simply aligning expectations. So I would sit down with that client and say, listen, if I were my dad, I'd say, I'm not running a bank. But I'm not. I'm not my dad. That's how my dad would say it. But you can say, I run a small business, and cash flow is critical. That's what's important to me. So I can't float an invoice for more than 30 days. I, I can't. I love working with you. We've had a long-term relationship. It's been 20 years. We've got a great working relationship. And I want to continue that working relationship. But I cannot have any invoices that go past 30 days. What can we do? Pose it as a question, and then see what they say. They may say something that you didn't realize. They may say, you know what, listen, I'm really sorry we didn't communicate this, but we've got a whole new accounting system. We've got a whole new department. We've been acquired by another company, right? And they pay net 90. We used to pay net 30, but they pay net 90. Um, I might be able to go back and get you net 60. Would that work for you? And then that's up to you whether that works. They may say, that's just the way we do it. But then you, it's up to you to decide whether that's something you can live with or not. Pose it as an open-ended question. And if you heard what I said, I didn't lay any blame, right? I simply said, that I've set some, some boundaries for me, right? I can't float invoices past 30 days. It, it doesn't work for my cash flow. I'm a small business. I count on that cash flow. Nothing about the client. This is about you. Let's talk about your, the, um, your um, situation again, right? So um, I've delivered phase one of a project. I've gotten paid. I've moved on to phase two, okay? First of all, that's not how I structure my deals, okay? The way I structure my deals, if I've broken something into phases, if it's small phases like what you're describing, so let's say the phases are a month, I will do a deposit and a final payment on each phase. So I treat the phases as separate sections of work. So let's say a phase is $10,000. I'm just picking a number. It's $5,000 at the beginning of the phase. It's $5,000 at the end of the phase. Phase two, it's $5,000 to start this phase. It's a new phase of work. You did that. Okay, so the, the comment was that, that the client said they, up, they, they sent a payment and you started work and then things went south, right? You broke your own boundary, right? In, in my situation, I would say, I will start work once I receive your deposit. Again, same situation up here. I'm running a small business and cash flow is critical. So I, I'm, we're, we're anxious to get started. We want to get started as soon as you, as, as you do, but I need that deposit to get started on this phase of work because I've got people to pay. So you, 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 you broke your own boundary. Or maybe you, didn't, maybe you didn't set the boundary to begin with, but that's the boundary I would set. I'd say, listen, I'm not willing to start, and I, you can communicate to the client, and again, it's about you. I'm not willing to start work until I've been paid this deposit. POS meaning point of sale or piece of, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let me see if I can sum this up. So you've started a project. There's a, another resource that he's hired, right, um, to do a part of the project, and they, in, they've delayed. And that's caused, they've caused you a delay, 
that, that external resource has caused you a delay, right? So you've collected 75% of the, of the money. Um, you can't do the rest, the other 25% of the project until this piece is done. So you're dependent on this external resource. Was that expressed at the, at the onset of the project? Had you started the project before that decision was made? Okay. So the project was started before the decision was made as to who was going to put in the POS. Did I, the point of sale. Did I say that correctly? Okay. So this, whatever this external API integration, um, the project was started before the decision was made as to who the resource was going to be to do that. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tangent for a second on purpose. The, the one phrase that I encourage you to take out of your vocabulary, and I've done this and it, it, it's worked wonders, is the phrase change order. When I say change order, half of you cringed, right? It's got a negative connotation to it. If I say the word change order, my client, they always go, oh. You know what I call it now? The scope adjustment. A scope adjustment. It's the same thing. I just gave it a different name because change order specifically has a negative connotation. Okay? And when I describe a scope adjustment, what I talk about is the impact. So when somebody calls me with a change or we're on a call and we start to hear a change, my team is trained to jot it down and then afterwards say, this is the, this is the scope adjustment that we heard. We'll, we'll get back to you with the impact to the project. I didn't talk about cost, because the impact could be timeline, it could be cost, it could be both, it could be none. So we're going we're gonna to analyze the impact. Now I say that because what you experienced is a scope adjustment. Okay? And I say this very specifically in my contracts. If I experience a delay that I didn't cause, that constitutes a scope adjustment. That language is in my contract. So you didn't cause this, right? And now you've been delayed for months because of this decision that your client made. It's out of your control. That's an adjustment to scope. There's an impact. It's impacting your team. It's impacting your other projects. It's impacting your production schedule. There's a cost associated with that. And so I would call that client and communicate that. Even if that's not in your contract, even if you haven't defined a, what, how a scope adjustment is, works, you can always have a conversation and say, this is what I'm experiencing due to this delay. And you notice I didn't blame anybody in that statement. There's no blame statement. There's no you or I. Because of this delay, this is what I've experienced. I'm sorry, I did say I. You can't control your client's reactions. The question was, or the, yeah, the question was, what if you say that and they get upset? Oh, well. I didn't cause that, them to get upset. I'm expressing what works for me. These are my boundaries. You've caused me a delay. And as a result, we're going to discuss the impact. They may say, I've never expected something like this. We didn't discuss this up front. Go F yourself. That's on them. I would write, go right back and say, listen, I, I just wanted to call and inform you that I'm experiencing this. And as a result, there's a cost associated with it. It's fair, but I think it sounds a little complaining. Right? So the question was, is it fair to say this is how it's impacting my other projects? I think that's fair to say. Right? You can explain if the client doesn't understand, in Clayton's situation, the client gets upset, 
It's okay to explain, listen, I just want to educate you, right? This is, this is the impact on, on the rest of my production schedule. That's okay, right? As long as it's not complaining, you know, he, he, here's, here's why there's, a, there's an impact, here's why there's an additional cost, right? I'd put it back on him. I, I get it, I'd put it back on him. Actually, what I would say is, is listen, I know you wanted this out six months ago. Yeah. I've done everything within my power. But now we're both, we're both feeling, you know, this. Unfortunately, you know, th th this is impacting these things for me and I have to charge you. Anyway, I think, I think we're done. Um, but we are going to move into, there's going to be Q&A for a half an hour. We're going to move right into that. I know we sort of started start Q&A, but thank you for, uh, I appreciate it.